Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Rooted Fellowship Digital. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Ane Mokakla. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors at Rooted Fellowship. Now, uh, we are supposed to be continuing in our series through the book of Exodus, um, but we're going to take a break, and I'm hoping it's just for one week, uh, because I would like to address from the scriptures, I would like to address uh, what's happening in our country at this particular moment. There is a national crisis, and, and there's no other way to put it. There is a national crisis, and so I'd like to address that. Uh, look, I know uh, because we are a people uh, who seek to hold one another accountable, I know uh, that we are looking for a response uh, from the president. We look uh, for responses from law enforcement, from the judicial system, uh, from society at large. Uh, and that's important. Uh, but we must ask the question, what is our response to all that is happening? Uh, as the people of God, as the church, what is our response? How should we respond to everything that is happening around us? Uh, now, let me be honest. Uh, this last week has been incredibly difficult for me, as I know that it has been for many of you. Uh, I have bounced around uh, emotionally from uh, hurt to pain to frustration, uh, just to figuring out what is going on. Like, what on earth is going on. Uh, I've even been in spaces of hopelessness. Um, and I know many of you have as well. Uh, just the few conversations that I've been having with uh, a few uh, friends and family, uh, I know that that is the reality of where we are. And so I have come to God's word, uh, as we always should, uh, regardless of the season that we are in. Uh, we should uh, seek the heart of God in all matters, uh, even in a time such as this. And, and so I've been reading, uh, reading uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, and I found myself in the book of Micah, uh, the prophet Micah. And, uh, and as I've read it, uh, I've resonated with it quite a bit. Um, in fact, uh, as I read what goes on in the time of Micah, um, it led me to ask myself this question, are we living in the days of Micah right now? Are we living in the days of Micah? Uh, there's so many similarities uh, to what Micah was experiencing and what we are going through at the moment. Um, and so for our time today, uh, I'd like us to turn to Micah chapter 6. Uh, Micah chapter 6 will be in the first eight verses. Now, if you're unfamiliar with uh, this prophet, um, let me, uh, by way of introduction, give you some context. The book of Micah, in summary, is a book where God announces judgment against Israel. Uh, Israel has exploited the poor and twisted the laws of the Torah, and God's justice means that he will deal with them severely. But Micah's prophecies are not without hope. Uh, the God of Israel is also faithful and full of mercy. God's promises uh, to uh, preserve a faithful remnant from which he will create a new Jerusalem are there. They're evident. He will create a new Jerusalem, a new community on the other side of sin and exile for these people. Now, now who, who is Micah? Right? You've set the scene on it, but who, who is Micah? Well, Micah was a, a prophet who lived near Jerusalem around uh, 700 BC, uh, during the same time as the prophets Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos, and during the reign of uh, the kings that we read about in Second Kings and Second Chronicles. Uh, there were good kings, and there were bad kings, and then there were very, very, very bad kings. And since the kings were absolute rulers, they influenced both politics and religion. If the kings set up places of worshiping idols, the people would worship idols. And so Micah confronts these corrupt leaders in the first few chapters of his prophecy. He goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Uh, but here, in our chapter today, in chapter 6, he turns from the leaders and then he turns to the people. 
Uh, he addresses the people, you and I. He speaks to us. And so jump with me, Micah uh, chapter 6. Uh, we'll see in verse 1 that he begins with a strong call to listen. A strong call to listen. Listen to what the Lord is saying. That's what Micah says. Now listen to what the Lord is saying. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your complaint. Listen to the Lord's lawsuit, you mountains and enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people and he will argue it against Israel. See, Micah paints a picture of a courtroom, if you will, a court of law uh, with Israel on trial before the Lord uh, in the presence of unshakable, unwavering, unflinching witnesses. Who are they? The mountains and the hills and the enduring foundations of the earth. And so as they would say, uh, court is now in session. A similar thing can be seen in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, where it says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. And, and so here we are before a holy God. And he has some things to say to us as his people. God, through Micah, brings his case, his complaint against Israel, his lawsuit. God is bringing a complaint against his people for breaking his covenant. Now, when we hear the word covenant, uh, we should think promise. Uh, those words are synonymous. Right? We should think promise. God makes covenants. He makes promises with his people. When we think of God's covenant with his people, uh, who should come to mind? Well, we've been navigating through uh, the book of Exodus, and right out the gates, uh, we hear uh, that God had established a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob. He had made promises to them. God establishes a covenant with his people, and when he does so, it has implications for us. Always. It always has implications for us, for how we are to respond to him and how we are to respond to others. And so what we see here is that God has not forgotten his covenant. He has not forgotten his covenant, which simply means that God has not forgotten his people. He will not let his people wander away from him and take his relationship for granted. He, he just won't. And friends, this should be so reassuring to us because it speaks to the certainty of our salvation. It speaks to the certainty of our inheritance that while we may wander away from God, God says, because I have made a covenant with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But it doesn't mean that he does not address us when we have wandered away. See, we are in danger of wrecking this relationship that we have with our Father in the same way that we wreck relationships with one another. We take them for granted. And when we do this, the relationship fades away. Now, let me be clear with God. God does not wreck the relationship from his side. It's always from our side. In fact, uh, if this was a conversation that God was having with us, uh, he would say, it's, it's not me, it's you. When we take it for granted, it fades away. The people in Micah's day had walked away from God. Which begs the question, with all that we are seeing today, have we walked away from God? And so God speaks. He speaks because he cannot go against his covenant and his promises. And so he speaks. He speaks through his prophets 
He speaks through Micah, and here's what he has to say. Verse 3, my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. He's asking, have I become burdensome to you? What have I done? God is asking this question of his people. Maybe another way uh, to phrase it is, is God is asking, have, have I not been good and faithful to you? Have I not been good and faithful to you? But Israel, you have responded by rejecting and rebelling against me. Uh, look with me in verse 4. He says, indeed, I, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from that place of slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam ahead of you. My people, remember what King Balak of Moab Proposed what Balaam, son of Bor, answered him, and what happened from uh, the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, so that you may acknowledge the Lord's righteous acts. After asking his people, uh, What have I done to you? What, what, what's gone wrong? Why have you wandered away? He then calls them in verses five, four and five, he calls them to remember. He says, Remember. Uh, remember what? Remember his righteous acts. See, God has not only done nothing wrong. He has done everything right. That's the difference between God and us. He has done everything right. And so when God speaks of his righteous acts, he wants us to see not just the righteous act of saving grace, but the righteous acts that flow from that saving grace. God doesn't just save us from our sins. He doesn't just save us from eternal condemnation. But then he gives us so much more. And he does so in this life. I know many of us, we, we are waiting and we should in expectation of, of the life to come. But, but I want you to know that God gives us so much in this life. And so he calls us to remember. He calls us to remember all that he has done in and through us in this life. Now, now let me be clear. I don't believe in the, the gospel prosperity movement. I, I, I don't believe in that. I, I actually believe that that is utter rubbish and, and that it comes from the pits of hell. However, I do believe in a God of prosperity. A God who loves his children and engages with them. He puts things right for his people. He does. We can page through this and we'll see it over and over and over again. He puts things right for his people. Those who were oppressed and those who were lost. Uh, we will see this in our Exodus series as we continue through it. Uh, but in our text today, he calls his people to remember his righteous acts. Because clearly they have forgotten. Clearly they have forgotten. And so in our text we see that there are, are, are four righteous acts that God speaks of. Four righteous acts that he calls them to remember. Uh, let us go through them real quick. The first one is the righteous act of redemption. We see this in verse 4. It says, indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the place of safe slavery. God intentionally goes back 700 years to Exodus. He's saying, uh, does uh, my deliverance of you, uh, does it have an, an expiry date? That's the question that he puts here on the table. Does it have an expiry date? Have you forgotten about it? Have you forgotten what I have done? If we think about it, when something has expired, it simply means that it's useless. Whether it's bread or milk, whatever it is, when it, it's expired, it's, it's rendered useless. We throw it away, but, but God's mighty redemption continues. It continues. There is no expiry date on it. it it's never useless. It continues. What God begins, he continues, and he will bring it to completion. And so he calls them to remember and so maybe the question for them and the question for us is, has the story of redemption in our lives, has it become boring to us? 
how Jesus died for you on the cross, has that become useless to you? This is something we must confront as God's people. Do we always need the new, the interesting? Or is the gospel enough? I believe we live in a day that worships the new and the exciting and costs aside the tried and tested and true. The gospel is true. We can anchor ourselves in it. What God begins, he continues, and he will bring it to completion. And so God is saying, remember that. Don't take your eyes off it. Remember that. The second act God speaks of, uh, that he calls us to remember, is that of his provisional leadership. His provisional leadership. Let's read the rest of verse 4. He says, I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam ahead of you. God names the leaders he provided to Israel when he led them out of Egypt, freeing them from oppression and slavery, saying, when I free you, I don't leave you to fend for yourself. No, I provide for you. I don't leave you wondering, going, what's next? I'm so thankful that, that I have now uh, been freed from slavery and oppression, but, but now what do I do? He doesn't do that. He provides for us leadership. Here, he, he gave them leaders. He gave them Moses, the mediator. He gave them Aaron, the priest. He gave them Miriam, the prophetess. This isn't the Lord of the Flies uh, scenario. I don't know if you've read that book where we're, we're a bunch of kids that just have been left to fend for ourselves. No, he provides for us. And so we must remember that. And in remembering, we must then ask the question, so where are our leaders get to that in a moment. The third mighty act God calls them to remember because he had given to them was protection. Protection. Verse 5, my people, remember what King Balak of Moab proposed, what Balaam's son of Bor answered him. God now here reaches to Numbers chapter 22. Now, if you're not familiar with that story, um, it's the story of Balak, uh, who was uh, one of the pagan kings uh, who wanted to defeat Israel. And so he, he got Balaam to uh, prophesy against Israel, to curse them, to destroy them. And so Balak tried. Uh, he tried to curse Israel, but God wouldn't let it happen. I would encourage you to go read the story. It's incredible. There's a talking donkey. I mean, it's epic. But we don't have time, um, and, and so let me uh, make uh, this point from that text, is that God stopped Balaam from cursing Israel. That's the point I want to make. God stopped Balaam from cursing Israel. So much so that, that Balak uh, came uh, to Balaam full of anger and said to him, why aren't you doing that which I have paying, paid you to do? Why, why aren't you doing it? And, and Balaam uh, said, I, I can't. Why? Because I can only do what God gives me to do. God stopped this attack on Israel. Again, God is saying to his people, we're back in Micah, he's asking the question, was, was that irritating to you when I did that? When I stopped an ungodly king from destroying you? I'm, I'm sorry, was that burdensome to you? Was it so hard to bear when I protected you. He calls us to remember that God is a God who protects, he covers, he watches over his people. And sometimes we can live as if he, he, he doesn't. We can live as if he doesn't care about us. We, we can live as if he is not all-powerful. The fourth and final righteous act that God calls his people to remember is that God fulfills his promises. God fulfills his promises. Read with me verse 5. He says, And what happened from the acacia grove to Gil 
go. He, he, he calls them to remember uh, these uh, two places. That, that in that, God fulfills his promises. Now, what we need to know um, is that he's speaking here of two locations. Uh, the first place is called uh, Shittim, uh, and this was where Israel camped before uh, they crossed uh, the River Jordan. The second place, Gilgal, is where uh, Israel arrived after crossing the river. What Micah is referring to here is that God keeps his promises. When he says, I will get you to the promised land, I, he will get you to the promised land. Because he is faithful. He is faithful. And so God is calling us to remember. Why? So that you may acknowledge the Lord's righteous acts. That's why. And, and he wants us to acknowledge all his righteous acts. Not just the act of salvation, but everything that comes from it. Remember, I have always been close to you. I've always been near. And so maybe for some of us today, we need to remember God's fingerprints in our lives. Scattered all over our lives from the day that he saved us to where you are today. Because we are forgetful people. It doesn't take too long. It doesn't take too long before we're looking to the heavens and wondering, God, where are you? Or, or maybe with our fists and going, how dare you? Be careful. That is not how we are to respond. God calls us to remember. And so in remembering... How should we then respond? How should we respond to all that God is saying in verses 4 and 5? Well, let me save you some time. You should not respond uh, like what we see in verses 6 and 7. Uh, let's read it together. Verse 6, what should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, uh, with year-old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? You should not respond like this. Now, now let, let me explain why. Because uh, at first glance, right, at first glance, it looks like a good answer. And so on a why, why do you say that we shouldn't respond this way? Well, it's because God, God sees the heart. He sees the heart. He, he knows what's going on here. While, while at first glance it looks good, right, it's like when we say things, you know, we go, mm, that sounds really, really good. But remember, God sees the heart. He knows what's going on inside. I believe what's happening here is they're just answering as quickly as they can to get God off their backs. They're going, how can we get God off our backs. What I want you to see is what's happening here in the text in Micah's day is what continues to happen in our day. It's part of human nature. It's part of human nature. That, that, that we just want the quick fix. Oh, okay, God, I hear you, I hear you. Okay, what, what should I quickly do? What should I quickly do to just get you off my back? And, and we do this in various ways. We really do. You know, some of the statements that, 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 that I hear and some of the statements that, that even I make, right? It's like, oh, okay, God, I hear you, but I mean, God, I'm not that perfect. I mean, really. I'm not that perfect. No one is. God, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, I hear you, but it's not really that big of a deal. We'll say things like that, hoping that it'll excuse us from what God is saying to us. We shouldn't respond like that. The quick responses. Okay, God, I'll bow before you. All right, let's quickly show up to a church gathering. Let me quickly show up to a, a, a Zoom gathering and, and just get God off my back. Burnt offerings, that's what they put on the table. Let's make sacrifices. Let's take it to the next level. Uh, year old coughs. Is that what you want, God? Will, will, will that be enough? Maybe thousands of rams with uh, 10,000 streams of oil. This is uh, what, what Solomon sacrificed to God. And so let's, let's do that. Let's be extravagant like Solomon. God, here, 
Surely that's enough now. I mean, things escalate and to the point where they become ridiculous. Should I give my firstborn for my transgressions? I mean, seriously. Seriously. Don't respond like that. Let's not look for the quick fixes as the people of God. God sees our hearts. He knows what's going on. He knows what's truly going on. So if not this, then, then how? How then should we respond? What is it that God is looking for? We asked that question. If Michael was here today, I believe he would say, I'm glad you asked. And then he would read to us verse 8. Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, to walk humbly with your God. He, he says uh, the right response to the gracious acts of God is clear and simple. It's directed towards others and it's directed towards God. It's clear and simple. There is no secret. Stop wondering. Stop uh, going to conferences and debating and wrestling and going, wow, well, what is it that God wants of us? It's here. It's clear. Mankind, he says. Some translations so, say, oh man. Humanity, the people of God. He has told each of you what is good. You already know. You already know. This is what the Lord requires of you. To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let me start with the end and work our way back. To walk humbly with your God. Friends, this is the, the basis for loving mercy and doing justice. It is the basis. It is the foundation. It is the launch, launching pad. Because of what God has done, we fully invest in being a healing agent to this broken world. And we do that through mercy and justice. We cultivate our walk with God. And as we do that, it gives us the necessary power and passion for us to fully engage See, I believe in certain places, the church has become impotent. We have no power. We are no longer effective. And this is because we've wandered away from God. If you're sitting wherever you are and wondering, well, wh why is the church not doing anything? Where is, where is the power? Where is the, the, the passion? Where is the effectiveness? We need to take a step back and ask the question, how is our walk with God? How is our walk with God? We're called to walk humbly with our God. This word humbly means that we move away from arrogance. We move away from our egocentric ways. We move away from always seeking to be better than others. And we move towards Simply accepting the gifts that God has given us that have been placed in us. And then we say, God, we want to glorify you with that which you have given us. And we do so by putting you on display as we serve others. That's what it means to be humble. To quote Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says, There is no greater mark of the true saint than humility. I believe Martin Lloyd, Lloyd Jones says this because of what he sees in Philippians 2, where it says that uh, Jesus was humble. He was humble. Humble to the point that he was so obedient, even obedient to the cross. And, and if humility is good enough for Jesus, then friends, it's good enough for the people of God. And so we're to walk humbly with our God. But we're also called to love faithfulness. Some translations uh, say love kindness or, or love mercy. And so which one is it? Is it faithfulness? Is it kindness? Is it mercy? It's all of the above. It's all of the above. You see, the, the word, this word in the Hebrew is chesed, which essentially and primarily means faithful covenant love. And faithful covenant love is kind and merciful. 
Faithful covenant love is loyal and good. Faithful covenant love expresses faithfulness. But I love the translations that say love mercy. Why? Because mercy has to do with kindness and compassion. God wants us to be drawn to mercy. He wants us to be a people of compassion to those who are in need. Now, this is not always easy because we see human need everywhere. It's everywhere. It's on our street corners. It bombards us on every social media platform. It's on every news outlet. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And so it's not easy. And so what we tend to do is we just uh, harden our hearts to it. We become judgmental people. We say things like, uh, uh, no, 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 look how foolish those people are. Look how manipulative they're being. We'll say things like, oh, no, no, look, look, they're taking advantage of fill in the blank. When rather we need to hear God say to us once again, as one of my people, I hope you love mercy. Why? Because that is what you have received. It's because you have received mercy. And then lastly, we're called to act justly. Or as some translations say, do justice. Do justice. Do what is right. Now, we have often defined justice by placing it primarily uh, in political, economic, and the judicial sphere, right? That's how we define justice. Therefore, excusing us as the church from what it means to do justice. And when we do this, it becomes very, very difficult for us to identify what justice looks like in our own individual lives, right? Because we point to other institutions. We ask questions like this. Why are the courts and the police not working? Why, why, are, why, why are, are, is the legal profession, why, why is it not working? Why are laws perpetuating racial and cultural and gender and economic discriminations? Why are business practices taking advantage of low-income households? Why are politicians failing us? Why? Why, why them? Why we pointed out there? And, and while those questions are important, we also have to ask the questions, why aren't we doing anything? Why aren't we engaging? When I think about justice, um, I like this definition. Right? It's not perfect, I know that, but I like it. It says this, justice is to create a world where all people have equal opportunity to fully develop the gifts that God has placed within them. I love that. Let me read it to you again. Justice is to create a world where all people have equal opportunity to fully develop the gifts that God has placed within them. Now, while this does include the bigger political, judicial, and economic challenges we face, it can also include the more basic activities. Programs like uh, how do we provide uh, uh, tutors and teachers to children in underprivileged environments so that they can also have equal opportunities to learn how to read and write. Uh, justice can also be uh, supporting an overwhelmed single parent who's struggling to find the time and the resources to give adequate uh, time to their children. Justice is getting involved in the overwhelming uh, orphan situation that we find in our country. Justice is paying your domestic worker generously and seeking to uplift them from their current state of life. Justice is to create a world where all people have equal opportunity to fully develop the gifts that God has placed within them. Having said that, doing justice is also developmental. Meaning that, that we don't simply give things away to meet a need, but we help people help themselves. Uh, to use the well-known fishing metaphor, uh, we don't just give people fish, but we teach them how to fish. But even saying that, oftentimes it also means uh, creating, creating access to capital, uh, a, creating a supply chain, uh, providing skills development, to help establish the ponds that are necessary for people to fish in. It's not just teaching them how to do it, but, but we've got to create those environments for them. Justice is developmental. 
not just for a few, but the desire is for all people. And so, what does God require of us? He requires us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. He's given it to us. It's here in the text. But having said all of that, now what? Now what? Well, let me close um, our time here. Uh, I'm not closing this conversation. This is something that we will continue to do in the weeks and months to come. Uh, But let me close our time here by seeking uh, to give some practical tools, if you will, to the question, now what? With everything that we're seeing now in our country and with all that we've seen in the text, now what? Well, uh, let me be abundantly clear here. Criminal activity is criminal activity. Criminal activity is criminal activity. I don't know when, at what point, we, even as the people of God, became a society that seeks to justify criminal activity. Those who perform criminal activity must be arrested and and the law must apply. I'm I'm blown away by how I'm reading how uh, even Christians are, are seeking to justify criminal activity. Remember, God calls us to do justice. Now, having said that, as we look to all that is happening around us, it's bigger than just criminal activity. It's bigger than just the looting that's happening and the the vandalism of property and the destruction of people's businesses. It's more than that. This is bigger than that. It's more complex than that. There are multiple reasons to why we are where we are today. Let me list a few. Poverty, corruption, systemic injustice, inequality, bad and ineffective leadership, a lack of boldness by our leaders, and not just in the business world and in the political sphere, but even in the church. Misinformation, which leads to gossip and lies, racism, prejudice, greed, the list goes on and on and on. There are multiple reasons to why we are in the situation that we're in. The brokenness of this society, the brokenness of this country, the brokenness of this world. But let me tell you this, you know what brings all these things together? You know what unifies all these things that I've just listed to you? You know what unifies them? It's not a political party. It's not a particular race. It's not a particular culture. It's not even a president. No, it's sin. It's sin. Sin is our common enemy. And as the people of God, we've got to realize that. Sin is our common enemy. Now now listen, we are called to call out sin. We're called to call it out. Call it out in people. Call it out in certain people groups. Call it out in uh, gender groups. Call it out in socioeconomic classes. Call it out in institutions, in our city, in our province, in our nation, everywhere. As the people of God, as salt and light to the earth, we're called to call out sin. Now, I know some people will hear me say this and go, Honor, I think you're going too far. I think you're going too far. We should just preach the gospel, right? Just preach the gospel. To be honest, I'm getting somewhat frustrated with those kinds of responses by some of my brothers and sisters. Yes, we're called to preach the gospel. You can go look at all the sermons I've ever preached, and you will see that there is a a clear call to the gospel. Surrender your life to Jesus because there is no hope other than that which is found in Jesus. So we preach the gospel, and we're also called to preach the gospel's implications. We see Jesus doing this. He comes and he preaches the kingdom of God. He says, repent, because the kingdom of God is here. He preaches the gospel, but what else does he do? He preaches its implications. Go read the Sermon on the Mount. It's filled with the implications of the kingdom of God. It's the implications of the gospel. So we preach the gospel, yes. And then we preach and teach. We disciple into our people, 
the implications of the gospel and then we release them into a broken world so that they might be true salt and light. You know what, let me, let me take you quickly to Ephesians. I'll be brief, I'll be brief. Let me take you to Ephesians. I love the book of Ephesians because uh, what Paul does in the beginning, in the first two chapters, he is abundantly clear. He preaches the gospel. He lays it down. I mean, brick after brick after brick. And what we're left with is just this beautiful building of the gospel. And then what does he do with the rest of the book? He begins to lay out its implications. So let me read you a, a few. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 28. He says, let the thief no longer steal. Right? So he calls him out. Don't steal. The Eighth Commandment. Don't steal. Stop stealing. I point you to Jesus. He's the one that's going to keep you from stealing. Stop stealing. And then, and then look what he says. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands. Oh. So, so, so the, the gospel takes root and transformation happens. And then he says, okay, don't steal. Now here's what you ought to do. Why? So that he has something to share with anyone in need. Don't steal. Work. Be honest in your labor. And then be generous. Be generous. Verse 29. No foul language should come from your mouth. But only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear it. It's the gospel, and from it flow its implications. We cannot just be a people who preach the gospel and go, you know what, forget the implications. You've got your ticket to heaven. You're all good. You know what James would say? He would say, your faith is dead. And I'm worried that in our society today, there's a lot of churches that are preaching a dead faith. So let me leave you with these questions. What does the Lord desire for you? If you're a Christian, this question is for you. If you make up the church, this question is for us. What does the Lord desire of you? And remember, He's already told us. So number two, what gifts and abilities has He given you for that? To accomplish that which He desires of you, what gifts has He given you? God is creative, beautifully creative, and he gives the church these gifts, but they're not for us to keep to ourselves. They're for us to put on display so that we might do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. And so what gifts has he given you? Third question, how can you step outside of your comfort zone to other areas the Lord might be desiring for you? It's a tough one. But it's one we must ask. What is God calling us? Where is God calling us? What is he calling us to do? We know that. What has he given us? Okay, cool, I got that. Now where is he calling us? And those places are never comfortable. They're never comfortable. Where brokenness exists, it's never comfortable. But remember, we're not alone. God has given us everything that we need. He's provided for us and he gives protection to us. And then lastly, what are the ways that you, what are the ways that we can make Micah 6, verse 8, actionable in our lives today with what we are currently experiencing? Let me uh, say it this way. Church, can we go back to where we have a vision of a better future for our society in this life? Because the kingdom of God is advancing. Can we paint a different reality for South Africa? one that reflects the kingdom of God. God's given us everything that we need to do so. So maybe we should get to work. Maybe we should get to work. Yes, we should hold government accountable. Yes, we should hold the business sector accountable. We should. The academic institutions accountable. Yes, but we are also accountable as the church. In the book of Revelation, we see God addressing seven churches. Not government, not business, not NGOs, the church. So how will we be remembered? What is our response? Do justice. Love mercy. And let's walk humbly with our God. 
now is the time. Let's pray. Father, give us strength to do this. Give us wisdom and insight. We need your Holy Spirit to lead so that we might follow. Our nation is in desperate need of a Savior. That Savior is Jesus Christ. And for those who have a relationship with Him, our call is to put Him on display where we live, work, and play. Make us your hands and feet. And in order to do that, we need your heart. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.